हेलो एंड वेलकम एवरी वन टूडे वी हैव विद अस गुरशरण दास गुरशरण इज द फॉर्मर सी ई ऑफ डॉक्टर एंड गैम्बल इंडिया एंड द फॉर्मर ग्लोबल एम डी ई ऑफ पी एन जी वर्ल्ड वाइड ही हैज अ डिग्री इन फिलोसफी फ्रॉम द हार्वर्ड यूनिवर्सिटी ही बिकेम अ फुल टाइम राइटर एट एज फिफ्टी ही इज ऑल्सो द बेस्ट सेलिंग ऑथर ऑफ इंडिया अनबाउंड द डिफिकल्टी ऑफ बींग गुड एंड इंडिया ग्रोज एट नाइट ही हैज रिसेंटली रिटन टू बुक्स Today he will be talking to us about one of his books The Dilemma of an Indian Indian Liberal over to you Gushra Well I'm going to talk to you on the dilemma of the Indian liberal uh and talk about liberalism's future in India at a difficult time I'm an old fashioned liberal and i hope my personal account of how i became a liberal and why i am disillusioned today and what gives me hope in the future will be of some interest to you <clears throat> india is a land truly a land of ironies when i was growing up India was admired for its robust liberal democracy but it was pitied for its socialist illiberal economy today it is a dynamic liberal economy but its democracy is slipping it's turning illiberal and this is happening paradoxically when india's stature has risen in the world and it is considered a democratic bulwark against autocratic china what does this reversal mean for our nation's future and indeed for liberalism's future in india i became a liberal in my 30s because i believed in openness the rule of law and tolerance for others views i also learned to be wary of power political religious economic power and liberalism offered me an ethically responsible order of human progress without excessive dependence on the state it did not surprise me to learn that this philosophy had been the reigning ideology of the world for two centuries as democracies and free markets had spread around the world and become the only sensible way to organize public life it is disheartening today to find that this decent idea is under grave threat around the world <clears throat> i grew up in the 1950s which was called the age of hope when jawarlal nehru was our hero and we were all socialists from 1950 to 1990 india offered the most amazing freedom to its people freedom of speech of life of association of religion and so on but it refused to give us economic freedom nehru meant well wanting india to become a more equal society but the bureaucracy gave him a terribly a terrible regulatory system that would crush individual enterprise for two generations and frankly opportunities for two generations of young people were sacrificed my hero c rajagopal chari who we lovingly called um 
<clears throat> whom we called um, Rajaji. He called it License Permit Inspector Raj. And I became a victim of this system. I worked for a company that made Vicks Vapor Rug. There was a flu one year, and the sales of Vicks soared. We in the company were happy. We thought we'd done good for the country during an epidemic. But at the year's end, just as we were celebrating, a summons arrived from the government claiming we had broken the law. Our production had exceeded the limit authorized it in our license. It was a criminal offense with a potential three-year jail sentence. I appeared before a, an official, a joint secretary to the government, who first made me wait for two hours outside his office. And then when I arrived in his office, he um, kept reading the newspaper. And I had two lawyers with me, both of whom were shivering. And, but we were too polite to go <clears throat> or something to remind His Highness that we were waiting for him to meet us. Finally, he put his paper down and he says, Kya? And I said, Kya, Saab? Aap bataiye. Aapne hume bulaya hai. And he says, I haven't read your file. Kya? So I showed him the summons. So he reads it. Oh, so you've broken the law. I said, yes. Um, and so I explained that there was a flu, uh, an epidemic, and uh, we did our duty. We ran the three shifts, and we um, kept the stocks of pharmacies and chemist shops stocked for this product. And in the end, we thought we helped millions of families uh, during this pandemic. And... Uh, he thought for a minute and he said, but you broke the law. And I said, yes. And he said, so you admit that you broke the law? I said, yes, I admit that. And then he says, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to make an example of your company. You multinationals, you companies, you come to India to exploit us. And you think that we are a poor country, you can get away with any breaking our laws? I want to send a message to the rest of industry that we, nobody is above the law. Now the lawyers really started shivering and I got very depressed at this thought. And so he says, now the law will take its course. Jao. So he threw us out of his office. As I was leaving his office, I turned around and don't know what got into my head. And I said, sir, uh, this news will go out in the world. We are an American multinational and it will appear in all the major newspapers. And what do you think the world will think of us as a country, of our laws, of our administrators, of our laws? when they read that here was a company that was doing good to its people during a health epidemic and you sent the persons to jail for doing what they were doing. He said, are you threatening me? I said, no, it'll get out. I don't have to leak it out. It's not every day that an executive of a company goes to jail, a multinational company goes to jail. Anyway, he threw us out and uh, the lawyers got very angry with me when I came out. He, they said, for God's sakes, you should have uh, dropped to his knee, your knees and begged for mercy uh, and look at you threatening him like that. Anyway, 
um, I had sleepless nights, but the government quietly, in its wisdom, dropped the inquiry. And, <clears throat> but, I abandoned socialism that day and I joined the Swatantra Party and became a classical liberal, which I am to this date. <clears throat> now, I don't blame Nehru for this monstrous uh, system, actually, because, you know, he was a creature of his age. He didn't know the only model India had at that time in the 50s was the Soviet Union. And so Mahala Nobis, the, his planner, um, in the second five-year plan, he basically put through this command economy that we had. And <clears throat> But I do blame Indira Gandhi because by the time she became prime minister, Japan had risen, Korea had risen, Taiwan was rising, and the global multilateral institutions were telling India to look at the success of these countries also. But instead of emulating their policies of exporting labor-intensive manufacturers, these policies which turned these countries into middle-class societies. Indira Gandhi did the opposite. She tightened controls, and India lost two generations, as I said, of opportunities for, your, for our young people. And Indira Gandhi justified this in the name of the poor. Her slogan was, Garibi Hatao. If you look at the statistics, the number of poor doubled in India between 1950 and 1980, at 82. Um, so it didn't do much for Garibi. Anyway, India finally got its economic freedom in 1991. And as a result, we went on to become the world's second fastest growing economy. Over the next three decades, we grew at an average annual rate of almost 6% over the next 30 years, lifting 450 million people out of poverty. And when the middle class expanded from 10 to 30% of the population. So India had achieved the liberal dream. And just when everything seemed to be going well, now here we had achieved this dream of being a full-blown democracy, a rapidly growing economy. What happens? Our democracy begins to weaken. And the past decade has seen the rise of identity politics, majoritarianism, Hindu nationalism, and Islamophobia. Critics are being silenced, and discourse on social media has become extremely polarized. The atmosphere of hate has damaged our cherished secular ideal of Sarva Dharma Sambhava, which is respect for all religions. Although there's been no communal riot on the scale of Gujarat 2002 or Delhi 1984, there have been many localized incidents of violence, especially amongst Muslims, especially against Muslims. Now, as, a, as we think about all this, I feel that liberals are also partly to blame. Liberalism remains an elite enterprise, and the rise of Hindu nationalism is partly a revolt against the English-speaking elite. Moreover, 
hardly any liberal political leader from 47 onwards has had a serious dialogue with tradition. Nor have we had a leader who has sold the ideas of the Constitution. And the people of India still believe that Constitution fell from the heaven one day and it's not ours. <coughs> Gandhi ji, alas, died too soon. He had been able, he was the one man during the freedom struggle who had been able to translate the liberal ideas of freedom and equality into the civilizational language of dharma. And thus he captured the minds and hearts of the masses. And so we have this situation today where liberalism <laughs> doesn't seem is an easy target for 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 anyone. Um, And and the, the you know the you just imagine if a, today India um, just fifteen percent of India is reasonably comfortable with English, and yet today almost all the serious business of the, the government of the private sector is done in English. And if a bright, young, intelligent Indian boy or girl walked in, even walked into this room, they'd feel deaf. Imagine feeling deaf in your own country after 75 years of independence. There is a bit of tragedy in that. And that is part of the anger that is responsible for where we are. Anyway, so my dilemma in this last Lok Sabha election was that a liberal today is neither electable nor is there hope for a true liberal party. Alas, Swatantra Party died long ago. Worse, I had no one to vote for in this election. I could not vote for the authoritarian identity politics of the BJP, which was turning our liberal, proud liberal democracy into an illiberal one. Nor could I vote for the Congress and the India Alliance because I do not trust for one minute its populist, statist economics ever ready to make a false trade-off between growth and equity. India may have become a fast-growing, maybe the fastest-growing economy in the world today, but the truth is it has not created enough jobs. And why? Because it has fail to create an industrial revolution. Manufacturing is only 15% of GDP. It employs less than 11% of the people and manufacturing exports are less than 2% of world exports. So how else will 45% of our workers in India who are stuck in agriculture hope to get more productive, better jobs. This will require tough reforms. And frankly, I trust the BJP far more and the opposition alliance far less to execute this reform. I trust them far more than the opposition. And that is really the dilemma of the Indian liberal. But there's, there's some good news. The results of this election give one hope. It vindicates a belief 
of political scientists who were actually my teachers uh, when I was at Harvard, Lloyd and Suzanne Rudolph, who in the 1980s observed in India an interesting trend. They called it persistent centrism. And they called it a striking feature of India's politics. And the reason for it is that our social pluralism draws a limit against extreme ideologies and forces the center towards the center, uh, neutralizes these in extremities to persist, to sort of push them towards the center. And this partly happened in this election, that every state had its local reason for letting the BJP down, except for a few states, it had a different reason. But there was observers, especially studies like the CSDS survey, uh, showed that there was an undercurrent of anxiety across the country and was about jobs. <clears throat> now, the jobs thing, our employment numbers don't show it because uh, the employment numbers in India is problem is not unemployment, problem is underemployment, and 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 the, our surveys, uh, labor's data, reflects only people who are not working. But what what do people do when they can't get jobs they like? They they have to work. They have to do something in the bazaar, become pakora walas, or they go and work on the farm. Anyway, so we have to do that. Uh, we have to create an industrial revolution. We have to create jobs. And what the Rudolph said was that our social pluralism draws a limit against extreme ideologies. And this explains this result of this election. Moreover, the, the good news from uh, the perspective of democracy is that we are an argumentative lot. We are a disobedient people. Amartya Sen pointed this out many years ago. And this results in an open, liberal temper. Besides, in a land of 330 million gods, no God can afford to feel jealous. The seed for skepticism has actually sowed in the Rig Veda, in the 10th chapter of the Rig Veda, in the famous Nasadiya verse, where they are asking the question, how was the universe created? How was the cosmos created? And so, one side says, well, it was dark, there was no being, and uh, how can we know? Maybe we should ask the gods, but hang on. The other side says, the gods came afterwards. How do they know? Oh, then let's ask the Brahmins. Oh, but the Brahmins are always arguing with each other. So we'll just get confused. And then they go back and forth like this. And finally, the Rig Veda concludes that maybe we don't know. Imagine the oldest, the most sacred Veda concluding that we don't know. So the skept temper of skepticism, the seed of skepticism, was sowed in 1500 BC. Anyway, this temper was nourished in the Upanishads, which were mental experiments. They used this method, neti neti method, of arguing and questioning. It existed in the epistemological debates on pramana among the competing schools of philosophy during the early years of the millennium going into the Gupta age. And philosophers of all sects 
in, and, and also Buddhism and Jainism, they concluded that the only source of true knowledge is non-transcendental. It is perception and inference. Anyway, all these reasons make me optimistic about liberalism's future in India. And also, frankly, history tends to be cyclical. If we give up on liberalism, our children will return to it. Besides, liberalism is too decent an idea. It is still the most sensible way to organize public life and it won't be kept down for too long. Thank you. Thank you.